Hi, this is David Hillier here and I'm going to give you a video today on asking the question, are markets irrational? And in particular, I'm going to be covering some empirical studies that maybe show some evidence that markets are indeed irrational. Now, by just by its nature, I'm only going to give you a, a, a snapshot of research. Research is always coming out on this topic. And you'll get as much evidence for markets being efficient as you do for markets being irrational. So just keep that in mind while I go through some of these these papers. Um, so it's let's start off by uh, this case here. So what we've got is um, we're looking at uh, the share prices of Royal Dutch and Shell now. In the, the early 60s, the, these two companies merged, uh, but at the same time they kept a separate share price. So they had a Royal Dutch share price and then they had the Shell share price. And that only went up to 2004, so you could argue that maybe it doesn't apply anymore. But the, the way in which the merger took place was that it was a 60-40 merger, so it meant that the Royal Dutch share price should have been one and a half times greater all the time than the Shell share price. And what this study in this graph does is it says, well, okay, did that actually happen? Now, if the markets are efficient and you've got the exact same company, then by you would think by definition the share price of Royal Dutch would have always been one and a half times greater than the share price of Shell. And what you find that it wasn't the case the you you had in some periods the the Royal Dutch share price was higher than you would expect. So zero is what you call parity. That is one point five times um, the shell price. So for periods the Royal Dutch shell was was higher, and then for other periods the Royal Dutch sh uh, share price was lower. And you get quite a lot of variation if you look at the percentage deviation from parity. That's massive. One thing you can actually see is that it does actually converge to an extent to parity, but even then you're getting quite significant, um, you're getting quite significant deviations. And this just doesn't happen to uh, Royal Dutch and Shell. I've got, and I've got this in my notes here, it happened uh, to Unilever, uh, the Dutch share price of Unilever and the UK share price of Unilever. And also for uh, Smith Klein Beecham as well, um, you we've got data that comes from Lamont and Taylor in two thousand and three for 3Com and Pam Inc. So you you can see that there are deviations in prices where you would theoretically expect or not to be any deviations in price. Now, why would that be the case? Well, it comes, comes back to the limits to arbitrage that I discussed in my previous video, that arbitragers or market uh, participants can try their very best to exploit the mispricing. But if it, the mispricing lasts for too long, they'll run out of money. And again, I'm going to quote um, a, a statement, so I'm just looking at this from my book. And it's from uh, John Maynard Keynes, the, the, the wonderful economist, saying, markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. Uh, so that's it's a good insight into why you may see these deviations and the fact that no one is taking advantage of them. We can look at earnings surprises. So this is a paper from Kol Kolosinski and Lee. And what this is doing is this is looking at uh, portfolios of companies that have had the biggest earnings surprise. So when we talk about earnings surprise, we, we say, well, there's the level of earnings that a company is expected to have from analysts. And then you get the actual earnings and where the difference between what is expected and the actual is the surprise. And in these two lines here, we're, we're looking at the portfolio of companies with the most extreme positive surprises and the portfolio with the most extreme negative surprises. Now, you're seeing something quite interesting here. You're, you're seeing that even though there was a massive uh, surprise, 
that it actually took six months for prices to respond to that. And, and that's evidence of conservatism where uh, investors don't put all confidence in the, the information that's coming out. And you're also seeing in the, the negative surprises there may be an element of overreaction there uh, because you're seeing this mean reversion um, that uh, by six months the returns are only, or the cumulative return is only uh, minus 0.11%. Now, this isn't actual return, this is the excess return. So, you know, you, you would expect there to be a positive reaction to very positive news and you would expect to see a negative reaction to very negative news and it would be much more than the market is moving so the market may be going up but then you're going up by more and it's that excess that's important <coughs> <coughs> sorry about that i've got my cup my tea here that i can take right now let's look at uh, another video and i could have cut that part but i, I prefer just to to talk uh, naturally and what we're doing here now is looking at portfolios of companies that have high book to price um, ratios. So that is, you've got the, the book value divided by the market value of the equity. And if you think about this, I, I cover this uh, price earnings ratios in an earlier chapter. But uh, this is the, the opposite or the, the inverse of price earnings ratios because... Uh, or price to book ratio. So you've got the accounting term here in the the numerator and you have the the market term in the denominator. So you've got book at the top and market down below. And so high book to market stocks are ones which you would call value stocks. Um, and the opposite, low book to price stocks are the growth stocks. And if we look at this, and across majority of cu countries that have been studied here, we see that high book to price stocks are uh, have higher returns than low book to price stocks, and it's fairly consistent. It's fairly consistent across the whole of uh, Europe here. So, what causes that? Is that irrationality? Is it mean reversion, or is it an unknown risk factor? that we haven't taken into account. Well, researchers disagree on this and uh, the debate is still ongoing. So again, it's, it's probably typical of, of finance research that there are actually, that no one agrees uh, all in. So you've got the theory, you've got what you expect to happen, and then what actually happens in practice is, is completely different. So that this is a bit of a, an anomaly, uh, something which is, it leads to a lot of discussion amongst finance researchers. And I'm going to just finish off now with uh, the bubbles and crashes. And we're looking here at the internet uh, boom and bust. So there, there was an internet bubble that everyone regards this as a bubble uh, that took place uh, just at the turn of the millennium. And it was a bubble because we, we just saw the, the advent of the internet. This was when the internet came about. And investors wanted to get into this. It was a new craze. Um, I think now you could probably say that uh, wearables, uh, the smart uh, wearables in terms of where you've got all the technology in your hand, maybe AI, artificial intelligence. These are the big areas that people are looking at now. Fintech is another area using big data. But at this point in time, it was just the internet stocks. And these stocks weren't making any money. Uh, they, their earnings were all negative. But everyone was interested in them, so they were investing in them. And the values, because supply and demand, the values in internet stocks, you can see, jumped tenfold. Uh, massive. And yet, at the same time, they weren't earning any any money. They weren't The, the business models weren't profitable. And uh, they were untested to an extent. So you had a lot of investment went into these stocks. The value market values shot through the roof. But then these companies started to go bust. They started to get into financial difficulty. And when they did, the price the investors started to realise, oh, oh uh, there's something maybe not right here. 
and everyone's starting to go because companies were going bust, they were going to the wall. And that gives evidence that maybe investors were investing not on actual real market fundamental information, but they were actually investing on sentiment that everyone else was talking about internet stocks, so everyone uh, had to to buy into those. And there is another bit of wisdom where uh, I've heard a number of people say is that when the newspapers start telling you how great something is, um, that's when it's time to jump out because that's when it's gone uh, mainstream and you get uninformed commentators all telling everyone how great this particular uh, investment is. So that's uh, evidence of a bubble where you get prices growing for no reason, just sentiment. And then when the sentiment bursts, the prices just collapse. And when you compare the the internet stocks to just the standard and poor's, you'll see that they just jumped for, for no reason. Uh, they jumped because the investors thought this was really important to get into, but without any real um, insight into the actual market fundamentals. So... A very quick approach to the empirical evidence on behavioural finance and uh, really try attempting to ask why why or if markets are inefficient or irrational. As you can guess, the jury's definitely out on this. My personal view is that the markets can go through periods of irrationality where groups of investors may go into the market for a short enough period where prices will move. And I'm, I'm not saying that they go in to manipulate, I'm just saying that their presence, their activities, the, the prices will just move uh, because they are driving through their sentiment. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the market as a whole is inefficient or the market in general is inefficient. So think about that. Think about the, the, the dynamic nature of efficiency. And uh, in the next video, I'll talk a bit more about that and compare both theories uh, to try and come to a, a, an overall view. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that enjoyable and see you again.